Cool. All right. G'day, everyone. Uh, we're very lucky to have Lachlan Christie from uh, Wally Parsons here today. So this is your introduction to mechanical engineering lecture. Uh, we've obviously been discussing, um, and I've put all the content for your project up. Uh, tutorial today will be, you'll look at a couple of actual centrifugal pumps, do some sketches, and we'll discuss that project and you'll get started on it. Um, and today Lachlan's here to actually talk about what mechanical engineering actually looks like in practice, in industry, uh, to give you a bit of context for everything we'll be talking about over the next couple of weeks. So we're very lucky to have Lachlan and uh, without further ado I'll hand over. Thanks Lachlan. Hello everyone. Um, as Dave said, my name's Lachlan Christie. Um, I uh, start off with a bit about myself. I graduated here from JCU in 2002. And I studied mechanical engineering. Um, after leaving university, I uh, worked for two years out at Queensland Nickel, which I'm sure a lot of you would be aware of where that is, out on the way north of Townsville to Ingham. I worked in, uh, as a maintenance engineer and in, with the operations team out there. Uh, after that, I had a year off and did some travel. And then I started working, um, I worked for nine years uh, in mineral process plant design um, and construction and commissioning for an EPCM company. EPCM stands for Engineering, Procurement and Construction Management. So they're companies that design, build and hand over to the client complete plants. And I'm currently working for Woolly Parsons um, on engineering design, some mineral process plants here in Townsville. Um, I thought I'd start off with just some generic stuff about what we associate with mechanical engineering. When I started in my first year, I didn't really have a good grasp on what mechanical engineering was about. Um, when I talk to people, you know, the common things you know, that we think of when we think mechanical engineering, things like steam engines, I guess this was the, the pinnacle of mechanical engineering before a lot of electrical engineering and electric motors were developed. Um, people always think of cars. You know, moving suspension, moving components, steering, all the mechanics of cars. Um, planes, people often associate with mechanical engineering, the aerodynamics, the jet engines, the mechanical systems associated with them. But to me, after I finished uni, mechanical engineering was about plant and equipment. And I dare say a lot of you, will, if you take on mechanical engineering, will work in some way, shape or form with industrial plants and mechanical equipment. Now this is a photo of a plant that I did some work in, that's in Papua New Guinea at Lahir Island, it's a gold mine. Um, and I just wanted to run firstly through some of the projects that I got to work on during my time. Um, the first one was uh, Bendigo Gold Mine. Uh, that is a gold mine obviously in Bendigo down in Victoria, it's very close to the town. Um, as you can see there, that's still under construction. You can see the cranes there to the left, the conveyors running back and forth between the buildings. And the unique thing about that plant, you can see it's, it was put in a hole, like they dug a big hole to put it in because it was so close to the town that they wanted to stop the noise from going out from the plant into the town. So it was basically put in a hole and they built up the sides, even had you know, a lot of stockpiles around there to keep the noise down. Um, that's just another picture, that's when it was up and running. That's, we've got, the, uh, got a crushed ore bin, which is the supply to the feed to the plant. You can see there's some conveyors there. Um, other uh, uh, process equipment. This is what it looks like inside one of those buildings. So if I go back there, that uh, building at the back without the cladding on yet, this is inside there. Um, and this is a typical process plant. And this is what it looks like. Um, on the left over there, there's what we call flotation cells, very common in mineral process plants. They're used to extract the mineral from the slurry. Um, and on this side over here, where this, all this grating is, and you can see there's some agitators spotted along there, some big tanks underneath, and that's the carbon and leach process, which is used in gold processing. Um, David said that you did some process engineering stuff with um, sand filters and carbon filters. Well, you actually use carbon the same to extract the gold out of the slurry. So it dissolves in cyanide and then the carbon, you put in those tanks and it actually, the, the gold sticks to the carbon and then you take the carbon out of the tanks. But you need to have it all agitated. Um, a lot of piping, etc. in those plants. 
I worked on the construction of this plant. It was probably one of my first uh, projects when I worked for engineering uh, and construction. And uh, you, you start off essentially with a blank sheet of paper. There's just a hole in the ground and nothing there. And you've got a set of drawings. You've got a whole bunch of equipment put over to the side, a whole bunch of steel work, a whole bunch of pipe, and you have to build it. Uh, this is typically what the engineering, engineering drawings look like. A lot more uh, mechanical engineering and engineering in general goes into the design phase of these plants than the actual construction. Um, but it's very difficult to actually show you what that looks like. It's much easier to show you the finished product. But uh, as a mechanical engineer and a design office, you'd be helped developing these drawings. Um, and that was the finished product, the gold at Bendigo. And there's some gold in the safe. Another project I worked on recently, this was in 2013, was the Achim Gold Project in Ghana. Again, it was a gold plant. Um, much bigger plant, this one. And I was there for construction and commissioning of this plant. So again, well, this is just a general photo of Africa. I guess I just wanted to show here, you know, working as an engineer, where you get to go in the world, in the different uh, countries, you get a lot of exposure to different things. So uh, certainly, I enjoyed going there and working in a foreign country. This is some more photos around site. Um, this is it during construction. Um, obviously, still tanks on the ground being built. A lot of steel work to yet go up. Um, these are the, the grinding mills in mineral processing. Just about all mineral processing um, plants have mills. You need to get the rock or the ore down to a very fine size and they do that with these big blue mills. The one on the right is uh, about 50% full with steel balls and the one on the left is about 40% and they just turn and all those balls turn around and, and grind away at the, at the ore. And then that, once the ore is fine enough, you can then uh, extract the gold out of it. Um, that's another shot of the process plant. As you can see, the tanks over on the left is what I talked about before, the carbon and niche tanks. Obviously a lot of steel work and pipe work in between. Um, this was one of the more nervous days for me on site. I was responsible for helping the contractor arrest this uh, conveyor and stock ball conveyor. As you can see, four cranes all in a very small space. It was a very nervous day for everyone. But we got there in the end. Wasn't we didn't drop it? Thank goodness. Um, these are just a few more photos of the plant. This is almost when it's finished. Um, these are the raw water dams supply the water to the plant, and you've got the plant in the background there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this one because this is essentially um, the primary crushing area of the plant, and this is what the area I was responsible for. So when I got to site, it was a, uh, basically that big earth uh, mound you can see there, with just a concrete vault in the middle of it. And uh, when you're working as a field engineer or on construction sites, you're responsible for coordinating all the construction activities, helping the contractors to install it, and making sure they install it as per the drawings that you're given. Um, the, the mining trucks actually tip in up the top there, in that big... Uh, earth bun there, there's a big crusher, crushes the, the rock from the mining trucks, it goes into a big bin and then gets fed out on this conveyor. This is just a transfer conveyor and then there's a long overland conveyor over to the plant. Over to the right here is the electrical substation which gives all the power to the plant. Uh, so that's up the top. You can see over here this reddish uh, sort of bump stop, that's where the trucks tip off back. Uh, there's you know, a structure over the top, there's a control room up there with an uh, overhead crane that services the crusher up there. There's also a rock breaker there, parked, it's, that uh, crushes big rocks that it can't fit in the crusher. Um, that's the primary crusher itself. You know, it's hard to gauge the size of that, but that would probably be about three and a half metres in diameter. And that's the underside of the crusher. So. We've got an electric motor, 
that drives the crusher. That crusher, is a, uh, the motor is probably a 350 kilowatt motor for memory. It probably doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but that's a lot of power to go into that machine. And after it was built, I was also responsible for commissioning this machine. And uh, it was probably one of the most rewarding things I've done in uh, engineering to have built this plant and then to start it and to see it operate. Um, the, the power going to that machine is huge and the actual insides of the crusher are huge steel mantles that rotate and starting it for the first time was a nerve wracking exercise for me. You want to make, you know, if something went wrong it goes really wrong so you have to be extremely diligent to make sure you've done all the right checks, you've commissioned it correctly and then you can start it safely. Um, that's just a photo of the crusher with trucks dumping into it. And that's it once it's, uh, once it's empty. That, that centre mantle there only just moves very slightly. You, you wouldn't think it crushes rocks, but those big rocks fall in there and ever so slightly as that turns, the rocks crush and they just fall down further, getting smaller and smaller. Um, this is just another uh, photo of the, the process plant and a chimp in Ghana. Those are the mills that are finished now. And uh, these are one of the big slurry pumps that the, the, what discharges out of the mills gets put in that big hopper up the top there and pumped away. David said one of the projects you're going to work on was the design of a pump. Um, so this pump was supplied by a company called Krebs and for Krebs would be people who did mechanical engineering and would design that pump. They'd design the impeller, the internals of it and then uh, people who worked for my company who did the design of this uh, selection of this pump would then do the pump calculation. They would work out um, what flow rate it needs to go at, what uh, material is going through it and they would do the calculation to work out the head, the volume and then they'd go to a company like Krebs and say, what pump can you supply to us? Um, and Krebs would have sales engineers, they're generally called, or applications engineers. So that someone has designed their pump range and then they select a pump for that duty. Again, they're quite large pumps. Um, just some out of curiosity, that's sort of the camp you stay on when you're at a mining camp. That was pretty good for uh, Africa, so I was told. It was the only one I'd ever been to. Um, another project I worked on was in the Philippines. I worked in the design office over in the Philippines. Uh, engineering is largely becoming a global, um, I guess, entity, as in Engineering does not, for Australian projects, does not just get done in Australia. We do engineering that, for projects in Africa and they can be done all over the world. Um, the company I was working for had an office in the Philippines, which we were doing a design for in uh, the Pilbara region, which is up in the top of Western Australia. And the client was based down in Perth. Um, this was just one part of the, the plant that uh, we designed up in Manila. Uh, you can see a series of tanks there, and at the end of those tanks there's a series of pumps and a lot of pipe work. These tanks actually uh, is what was used to store all the oils and hydraulic oils for a mining fleet, so all the haul trucks. So um, delivery trucks come unload their oil into these tanks, they're stored in the tanks and then dispensed into the workshop where they service all the heavy mobile equipment and it's pumped from there on demand. So they set how much they want to pump, hit go button and the pumps will automatically fill up the, the various tanks on the truck. Um, when you're designing something like this, there's obviously you know, the size of the tanks we need to calculate. There's a lot of Australian standards which govern what this would look like, how big that concrete bun needs to be, the, the maximum size that a tank can be. Um, there's a lot of environmental requirements for when you build things that store hydrocarbons. So as you're working as a mechanical design engineer, you have to become familiar, or you will get become familiar in time with the certain requirements you need to know to build these sort of plants. I never went to site for this plant, so to me, it just looked like that from the design office and a series of other drawings, but that was the general layout. So I guess it's always rewarding to be able to 
to issue that and then one day see the final product. And again, that's uh, some of the design drawings from the, from the plant. Um, this was the Christmas party for work and they knew how to have fun in the Philippines. They're very friendly people. Um, this was uh, a mine that I worked in, uh, Papua New Guinea. As you probably know, Papua New Guinea is uh, very mountainous and this, this gold mine was located on a ridge on two mountains. Over here you can see the camp where everyone stayed. In the background was the process plant and up coming out of the page here was the crushing station. You can just imagine how hard it was to build that plant in that location. So everything had to be trucked up, up the mountain. The elevation of that was about 2,500 metres high and it had to come from sea level on truck. And everything had to be trucked up there, had to try and be stored somewhere where the land was at a premium and then constructed. Not an easy task. So this is looking back from the crushing station. Um, you can see the clearing in the background on the mountain, that's where the process plant was and a conveyor going off in the distance. That conveyor runs down the mountain, eight kilometres all the way to the process plant. Um, that's looking back at the crushing station. Again, there was two crushers in there that got the rock down to the size it needed to be to go on the conveyor. And that's the conveyor running down to the process plant. It actually uh, was a, not a conventional conveyor, it rolled up a big piece of rubber into like a pipe and then travelled down the, the plant. We had a lot of issues with that conveyor. It uh, used to want to unwrap and spill everything everywhere or if the material was too wet, it all, when it went down the steeper sections the material ran faster the conveyor, blew out the conveyor and then it just blew out the structure. So it was a bit of a difficult piece of equipment to, to run. Again, that's just one of the conveyor, and that's the process plant. Um, again, more process plant. One of the projects I worked on at this plant, if this is the grinding building you can see here, and off to the left you can see a bit of a structure there. Um, when they started this plant, that, that what was in that structure, the equipment was in there didn't work. So what we had to do is remove that structure and put different equipment in and uh, you can see that here. So that's the grinding area to the right and we took that structure out and put the screen in. We put in all the steel work, the screen, the equipment and uh, then you know there's a lot of electrics that need to go into that to make that work as well. Um, again some of the guys I worked with, some Papua New Guineans, very happy with their day. So the mechanical engineering roles for these plant equipment plants, I call them mineral processing plants. Obviously we're big in Australia in minerals processing, especially in North Queensland. We've got a lot of mines close to Townsville. Um, people fly in and out of. Um, Cannington, Century, we've got Mount Isa, there's many out near Cloncurry. So a lot of you, if you graduate as mechanical engineers, will probably be employed and work in these uh, type of facilities. Um, as, a mechanic, as a mechanical design engineer, you're responsible for the layout of the plant and equipment. As you can see all those, you know, the photos of the process plants, there's equipment everywhere. Someone needs to think about where it all goes and what makes sense, what's the most cost effective arrangement, how it needs to be laid out to be able to do maintenance. Um, there's a lot of calculations involved in the design phase, sizing of pumps, tanks, how big a hopper needs to be. Um, how big a bin needs to be, the design of chutes, um, design of feeders, conveyors, you need to size all those pipes. So in all of those photos you can see a lot of pipes, all of those had to be sized and all had to be um, selected to be the right pipe for the pressure. Um, a lot of what mechanical design engineers do is sizing and tendering equipment and selecting equipment to go in those plants. So. Each one of the pieces of mechanical equipment in that plan, a mechanical engineer would have put out a package to tender and a few different companies would have bid to supply that equipment. So as a mechanical engineer, you need to give them all the information they need to then provide you with a quote and then you have to select uh, the best equipment based on cost and performance to go into that application. 
So once you get that vendor's the drawings for that bit of equipment, you then need to integrate that into the plant layout. Um, you need to review their designs, so once you've placed an order with them, they'll keep sending you drawings and you have to review them and mark them up and send them back and say you want this changed, we, this is not going to work, you know, you said you were going to provide this but it's not here, and you need to go back to the suppliers with that sort of uh, information. You'll uh, work with a lot of draftspeople um, and approving the drawings, so as, as I showed before, the design drawings is really the deliverable from a mechanical design. You need to help the draftsman come up, you know, do the drawing. You have to guide them to make sure you get what you want. Um, and as a mechanical engineer in the design and mineral process plants, you kind of sit in between a lot of other disciplines. So, you know, the process engineers are generally the first on the job. Like, they'll design the process. Um, you would have had some insight into that when you're doing your sand and carbon tank, like how big, how much sand, how much carbon do you need, what sort of flow rate do you want to put through it, that's what the process engineers come up with. It then really gets handed to mechanical engineers, um, we size all the equipment, start doing the plant layouts, and once we've got like a, uh, a structure of the, our equipment sits in, we need the help from the structural engineers to then design that structure so it can take the loads for that equipment, it will hold it up. Um, and then once the structural engineer does a design, you have to review it. It may have put bracing everywhere and you can't walk around anymore. And you have to go back to him and say, no, we need access through here. You know, yeah, you do something different here. And then a lot of your equipment is electrical, electric powered. So you have to work with the electrical engineers to get their input when you're buying the equipment. You have to, uh, once you've bought the equipment, you have to keep them informed through various ways of um, what they need to power, the different controls that that equipment needs. I'll just try and go back. So that pump there, so that would have been a mechanical engineer's package to, uh, to buy those pumps. But you can see there's a lot of instrumentation, a lot of uh, you know, bearing sensors, etc. You need to help the electrical guys, the instrument guys know what's in that package and they have to do their design based on you. So as a mechanical engineer, you kind of sit in the middle in between different disciplines and you work with all the disciplines to get the design done. Um, as a mechanical engineer, the, the fields of mechanical engineering are, are huge. Not just so, you know, you can be uh, it's aerodynamicist, you can be involved in fluid mechanics, kinetics, material selection. And then within each of those fields, the fields, what you do as a mechanical engineer varies. So just in minerals process plants, you could be a mechanical design engineer. Mechanical engineers often also become project engineers. And project engineers work on the same projects, but they have a different function, different job. Um, project engineers, as you can probably guess, is sort of um, the juniors to become project managers. And they're really responsible for developing and tracking budgets and schedules to keep the job going. They have to coordinate all the design activities. Um, they have to manage the clients, third party consultants if you're going to use them. They manage contractors and all the project personnel. They develop uh, scopes of work for installation contracts. So in, when it comes time for construction, um, the project engineers generally write the scope of work for the construction and the contract, and then they go out to the market and get people to bid on doing the, the construction. So they have to manage those contracts all the way through. Um, and it's a very challenging role, but uh, some people seem to relish it. And they're often the interface between engineering, procurement, who buys all the equipment, and the construction guys. Um, in, as a mechanical engineer, you could work as a field engineer, which I did on a few of the projects you saw there. So you're a site-based engineer. You uh, are responsible for coordinating day-to-day -day site activities for construction. So you're going to help guide the contractor as you know what he needs to do next or what's coming up. Uh, you manage the site contractors with any issues they have. Uh, you resolve design issues on site. 
So no design's perfect, there's always issues. There might be errors in fabrication, there might be errors with supply. So those issues come up every day and you have to assess those issues, decide what to do and instruct the contractor, normally through a site instruction. If it's a really big problem, you generally go back to the design guys, but you generally handle all the day-to-day -day issues that arise. Uh, you work with equipment suppliers, so all those people who who run the tender and supplied the equipment, when it arrives on site, there's you know, sometimes issues with what was supplied, it wasn't correct, you have to deal with them and get it sent over. In Ghana and countries like Papua New Guinea, that proves very difficult. It's, uh, it's at least a month to get anything to site. So you can imagine if you're working to a tight construction schedule, then if something's missing or something's wrong, to get it to site is a month away. So there's some challenges there. Um, you monitor and report on progress of construction. You sign off the installations at the end. So once the contractor believes he's finished, you have to inspect it and have to agree that it's finished or you have to tell him that there's more to do. You have to look at the design drawings and make sure everything's done. Um, a lot of the site-based work is making sure everything's done safely. It's a huge part of engineering these days, the safety aspect. Um, you won't really appreciate it until you get out there in the workforce, but safety, in a lot of big companies they say safety first, so nothing gets done unless it can be done safely. And on construction sites they can be dangerous places and you have to make sure that things are done safely. And finding lost equipment, I spent so many hours looking for things on site that no one else could find. This seems to be the field engineer's role. Um, the commissioning engineer, so this is uh, someone who starts the equipment for the first time. So the field engineer installs the equipment, or installs the plant, once he's happy with it, it gets handed over to commissioning engineer. Also mechanical engineers do this, but you have commissioning electrical engineers, commissioning process engineers as well. Uh, you have to develop the commissioning plan and procedure, like how you're going to commission the plant. You have to inspect and accept the plant. So once the field engineer believes that it's ready for commissioning, you have to do your own check, make sure it's all there, installed correctly. Uh, you energize the equipment for the first time, which means um, giving it its power supply. Again, that has to be controlled very tightly on site because when people are working in construction and you're trying to energize things and they're still putting cables in, it can be very dangerous. Something has to be coordinated um, you have to systematically test and prove the equipment and systems. Like that big crusher that I was talking about, when you uh, start it for the first time, it's a big problem if it doesn't go and, or if you break something. You have to be very systematic in testing every aspect of the crusher before you actually start it up. And once you start it up, you then run it with no load. You record all, you analyze, you know, all the uh, sensors, there's sensors on the lubrication systems, on the hydraulic systems, you monitor the electric power draw, and you run it until you're happy and you've proved that the equipment can run, and then you introduce the ore and you do the same again. Um, again, you have to manage equipment suppliers, things break during commissioning, you need to try and get new parts to site, and that would be the role of commissioning engineer. Again, you report on progress and ensure the commissioning is done in a safe manner. Um, another aspect of plant and equipment in, um, for mechanical engineers is where I started in maintenance. So once a plant is commissioned in an operation, uh, mechanical engineers, generally called maintenance engineers, will uh, be working on the plant as it's operating through its life. Um, the maintenance engineers generally generate the maintenance plans and coordinate maintenance activities. So no equipment can run for 24 hours, 365 days a year. You have to decide when you're going to take it down and repair it or change things on it. Um, and they also have to manage the maintenance budgets. So they have a certain amount of money they can work with to do all of this maintenance. And that's the maintenance engineer's responsibility to, to manage that budget. Um, plan and manage shutdowns. So when you do shut down the plant, you have to have be well coordinated or well planned to, uh, to shut the plant down, change what you need to plant, change and start it up again. Um, maintenance engineers do a lot of inspections, so when things are down or when you open up a tank, they'll go inside and have a look, see what the condition's like. They do a lot of condition monitoring. They also provide support to the tradespersons and the operations personnel. And maintenance engineers 
uh, do a lot of calculations as well because things change from the initial design over time and they need to check that things are still going to work or if they want to change things that you know, what they're going to change will work so again it's the same you need the same skill set in a sense as the design engineer in that to do that um, I guess that's all I had on my slides so, uh, a pretty good introduction to a lot of the different aspects of mechanical engineering in industry and certainly some other other branches of engineering as well which is great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Lachlan? Covered it? <laughs> nice. Well, the, the process, it's actually, they, obviously when they dig the ore, it's of a large size or varied size, we, they crush it first and then they uh, stockpile it so they have a lot of feed to give the plant and then they put it through those big grinding mills and then it comes out of that very fine, so one tenth of a millimetre in size. Um, that's in a slurry which gets pumped through those tanks, they add cyanide. Um, cyanide has a bad name, but it's really well controlled on site, and it's not that bad. It's not like in the James Bond movies where you'll die if you touch it. Um, and the cyanide actually dissolves the gold, so it's no longer in with the solid, it's actually in the solution. And then you use carbon to actually, it's actually, uh, the carbon is very porous, and it actually gets stuck in all the pores of the carbon, believe it or not. And then you just take off the carbon out of that. Um, you screen off the carbon, then you leach the, the gold back off the carbon with hot cyanide, and then it goes through an electro winning cell, which is uh, you know, cathode anode, cathode anode, cathode anode. You put a lot of electricity through there, and the gold plates off. Is you have any for examples? <laughs> no, unfortunately. That photo there was an old one. They're very, they don't like people going in the gold rooms these days. It's very high security. You have to get the pat down and you, you know, take your boots off and shake them out. It's a lot of security. Everything's on film. There's a few people in Papua New Guinea that were sent to jail for trying to take gold out of the gold room. Um, but yeah, I was in Bendigo, that first job I worked on, I was in the gold room and uh, they had a gravity circuit as well which got out the gold nuggets before they went to the grinding mill and there was a, a pan you know people pan for gold and there were just nuggets like that all just plated up on this this pan yeah, it was impressive to see mm. question oh yeah um the here on yeah that operation can you tell us about maybe some of the uh environmental practices around that island versus say what happens in Bendigo? Yeah, um, Bendigo was so close to town as well that uh, they had a lot of uh, environmental restrictions and generally in Australia you have a lot higher environmental standards than in Papua New Guinea, which you're probably alluding to. Um, the, I just mentioned the gravity gold there that they have in Bendigo. The reason for that is because they didn't want to use a lot of cyanide. So because they had a lot of nuggety gold, it was actually in, in the environmental license that had to try and remove that nuggety gold before they try and leach it with cyanide. So the whole environmental practice at Bendigo was to minimise the amount of cyanide required on site. Where in Lekia, it's they uh, they don't have as, as strict requirements to work with. It's obviously just different governments have different rules, and uh, they have, I guess. At Lahir, there's not a lot of room and they put a lot of their tailings in a, into the sea as well, which is uh, not a done practice here in Australia. We discussed uh, Australia's standards and environmental standards yeah. and how do you uh, what's the process in something that's designed here in Australia but then implemented overseas obviously the, the country of installations kind of yeah. have its own set of standards? It's generally in the contract between the client and the engineering company what standards are to be followed. So it generally works out that if there are standards available in those countries that, especially around environmental type requirements, um, that they'll be used. But a lot of times we use our Australian standards to design a plant in Africa or in Papua New Guinea. Like Papua New Guinea doesn't have 
the set of standards that we have in Australia. So um, generally says, you know, we'll follow local standards if required, but it will generally be built to Australian standards. And that's the most cost effective way because the engineers are familiar with them and they can, you know, they don't have to learn a new set of standards. Other questions? Um, how do you usually uh, get the power for all the machinery? Is it diesel or? Um, it varies between sites. At Ghana, they have a very big, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, sorry, hydro stations around Ghana. So there used to be a big aluminium industry, so that which requires a lot of power, which is not there anymore. So they have a lot of power available. A lot of sites use diesel power. Um, and that, so they've just got big diesel storage tanks and diesel generators. A lot of converting to gas now. Um, but so it's a, they, uh, no, no, just a pipeline. So they'll connect up to a gas pipeline that's running somewhere, and they'll, and they'll draw off that. Um, like say in Bendigo, it was just off the local grid. You have to arrange obviously, and have to get approval with Ergon to be able to draw off that much power and they may have to upgrade some of their system. Depends on where you are, really. Uh, so, um, we've worked on the site, there's an off-site. Um, can you describe some of the, the lifestyle um, changes that's affected you, um, working in those different situations? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, actually. Um, doing both the design office work and the, the site work. I found that it was, it was a good change from having, you know, spending two years in the office to, to then going to site for a year. Um, sites are, the rosters are obviously the thing that um, are a lot harder. So when I was working in Ghana, I was there for eight weeks at a time and home for two weeks. So when you're young, I'd suggest to jump at those opportunities when you don't have family and kids. You learn a lot, a lot more than you could ever learn if you, you know, if you were only in the office or never went. Um, but the site is, it can be quite fun on site. There's, there's uh, bars and, you know, everyone socialises and they have organised events. And it can be a lot of fun. On weekends you can, you know, do trips if you don't want to go home on your two weeks. A lot of people went going to Europe to uh, holiday for two weeks, coming back to site and doing that. So the, the arrangement was, if the cost of your flight to get home was five thousand dollars, they'd basically you can go anywhere in the world for that five thousand dollars. So there are some good aspects of working on site. So, um, but the design office, I think, it, it, you're you're really effective when you're on site once you've been in the design office and know the the thought process that went into making things. You're a lot more comfortable changing things on site if you understood why it was like that way in the first place. Um, I actually believe though that. Once you get into the senior ranks, the, the, the hardest part, the hardest job is actually being in the design office, managing the design. It's very hard to manage, you know, something that you can't see, you know, hundreds of people working on it, trying to manage it to a budget and to a schedule is a, is a difficult job. Any other questions? I've got a final one. Um, so, uh, CPE or, or registered practicing with uh, Engineer Queensland. Uh, have you worked towards either of those and can you comment on the process towards that and maybe how many engineers in say a design office might be working towards that or have that? Yeah, because I've worked, I'm currently going through the process now. Mm -hmm. I only returned to Townsville probably uh, a year and a half ago because I was working away. Mm -hmm. I was working for international companies doing international projects. It was never really a requirement for me to have uh, the registered professional engineer of Queensland, mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't, it was not a requirement for any of the engineers I was working with. Okay. Based in Queensland now, it is very important to have it. Yeah. Um, generally, you need, they'd like you to have seven sort of minimum years experience before you apply to, to do that, just so you get um, good engineering knowledge, good engineering base, and good engineering decision making before you. Yeah. Before you're responsible for signing off designs, um, so it's something I'm going through now. But generally, this you know, once you've had about ten years' experience, the majority of people will have registered. Yeah. yeah. 
there. Yeah. So for those that don't know, to get your registered status, generally you've got to put together a portfolio of all of the engineering that you've done over a period of years, potentially seven years or, or more, yeah. and then it's a panel interview, is it? Um, you have to submit basically career episode reports first, yep. so there's 16 of those all with a different uh, aim of you know showing a certain competency. Yep. And you have to write about work you've done, a project. A lot of those projects are included in my uh, career episode reports. Mm -hmm. And then you submit that, and then there's uh, an interview process after that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that gets you to the point where now you're the guy that can sign off on designs rather than just you know contribute to designs yeah. and, and, and work on them. And they're generally, most of the big designs will require someone with that to sign yeah, off on so them. Yeah, so in Townsville here, we every drawing that gets signed, it gets signed by about five people. But someone who's generally the senior mechanical engineer for when it's a mechanical drawing, for a structural drawing, will be the structural engineer, has to stamp it and sign it as the registered professional engineer of Queensland. Mm -hmm. So if anything did fall over for say on that, you know, he's the person responsible. So yeah. yeah. So just just remember that your four years of university gets you to a point where now you've got a whole professional life of learning ahead of you and this is basically the next step on your professional development if you choose to work towards that. And there's certainly lots of other types of engineering that you can work outside of that and project management and things like that go in a different direction sometimes. That's just another tool um, that you can, or direction that you can choose and it, uh, a, a lot of the time choosing graduate programs and things like that. Um, you can base, base which graduate program you choose for different companies on whether, the, you know, how they actually work you towards that type of status. Yeah, it's a good point. It, uh, your first job generally puts you on a path. You can change, but I mean, yeah. if you become a project engineer or you apply for that role, you, you tend not to go down the design um, path. You know? So it's an important decision to make. Hopefully you have a bit of an idea of the difference now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, any other final questions? No, fantastic. We'll thank Lachlan again. Okay, uh, we have an announcement regarding the uh, AV, what is it, what are we calling it? Yeah, UAV Club. Um, and then obviously after that we'll be good and I'll see you all in the tutorial. All right. I just want to use this. Oh, what are we doing? It's not plugged into the internet. Oh, it's not. All right. it can be, but it'll take a minute. What are you going to say? That's all right. Yeah. Just yell into that. Okay. Um, I'm Ryan, for those of you who don't know me yet. Um, I'm part of the UAV Challenge Group. Um, it's kind of like an offshoot of the Robo Club, but I'm not in the Robo Club. Anyway, um, basically every uh, couple of years there's a challenge for up to 20 universities across Australia um, to create an unmanned aerial vehicle and then complete uh, a challenge um, autonomously. So basically this year uh, it's, a, it's called the Medical Express Challenge. Um, basically what we have to do is uh, design a UAV that's able to fly on a certain flight path. Uh, it's about 30 kilometers total and um, it picks up a blood sample from fictional Outback Joe and um, uh, lifts back off after he's loaded it onto the UAV and back to the, uh, the doctor um, where we are. So basically uh, there are four teams. Um, there's an administrative team, a flight a frame um, slash construction of the UAV team. Um, Nick Stewart is uh, actually in charge of that team. Um, there's a telemetry slash flight control team. We've got some good electrical engineers doing that. Um, I'm, in, uh, I'm the team leader of the computer vision team. Basically, our challenge uh, is to autonomously locate uh, Outback Joe based on his Akubra hat, his blue jeans, and the fact that he's, he's a fella. Um, pick a suitable landing spot near him, um, power down the vehicle, and then power it back up, and then fly back. Um, so is there anyone here who's actually enjoying EG1002? I know we all like to complain about learning MATLAB, but I really like it. And if anyone, okay, I don't see any hands, but if anyone is really enjoying programming like I do, you're welcome to come. Uh, we meet every Friday at 3.30 p.m. Um, and there's free beer. Uh, it's located in the Building 14 uh, JCU Robo Club um, room, which is just to your right as you go off the stairs. Or you can talk to me, again, my name's Ryan, um, and we'd be happy to have anyone who's interested on the uh, computer vision team, regardless of your programming experience. Thank Great. you.
Good. Thanks. All right, guys. Thank you. Um, I'll see you all in the tutorial.